Okay, while we are waiting, I might respond to the, the scientists from the Philippines who asked for a question raised about the impact of climate change on the diseases. So um, j just, just to let you know that one of the most impacted diseases from the climate change has been rust. Uh, for example, coffee rust is, is uh, especially in the Central, Central America region. It was only used to come at a lower altitude, but now it is coming at a higher altitude. So it has really impacted the whole coffee production in the Central America region. And also another one will be the blast. Uh, blast would be also very much impacted by climate change, especially the increasing temperatures and the drought stress. And then the last one I would like to say is about the aflatoxin, because aflatoxin is in a, caused by the aspergillus infection, which happens with higher temperatures and drought stress, especially the groundnut and the peanuts and corn and sorghum are impacted by that. So those three are the classic examples globally which has impacted the uh, climate change, particularly the high temperatures and the drought stress has impacted. But of course, you also know that uh, under climate change, the, uh, the intensity of the rainfall is going to be high, the humidity will be high, so that with the higher humidity, you'll also see a lot of other, uh, other uh, and spot, uh, like leaf, leaf spot diseases, so that's one question. And then I think there was another question which, uh, which, which the chairman asked, uh, related to the productivity of the maize and the wheat and how maize being a C4 plant, uh, why the productivity is decreased on those. But irrespective of that, most of the maize grown in the U.S. is temperate maize, not a tropical maize. So the temperate maize is a little bit more sensitive to compare to that of a tropical maize. So it looks like my presentation is up. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the AgriVision. First, I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Das, for giving me this fantastic opportunity today to speak to all of you today. And also wanted to thank the president of the SARM, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, for, for, for inviting me. So let me get my presentation. Today I will be talking about the sustainable uh, agricultural intensification to address sustainable development goals. What is the current status uh, of the investments of the research and also what's the current status of the what is needed in the future. So let me get my timer started. I have 20 minutes uh, set up so I'll, I'll make sure that I'll finish it on time. So first, uh, before I go into my talk, I'll talk about the current status of SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, new food security, nutrition security, and then introduce you to the concept of sustainable agricultural intensification. Uh, what does it mean and what are the various components of that? And then talk about the current status of research and uh, current investments and the future needs. And then we'll give you a global examples of how we can address some of the sustainable development goals, particularly the one related to hunger and, and uh, hunger and nutrition. So first, the status of the sustainable development goals. So we are, these are the, those of you, especially for the students who, are, who may not be aware of this. So sustainable development goals is a continuation of the Millennium Development Goals. So after the Millennium Development Goals were completed, then in 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals were initiated, and they have to be achieved by 2030. So we are already halfway through. So there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are listed here in this, uh, in, in this slide. Uh, just focusing the first two, one is no, no poverty and then zero hunger. Those are the prim primarily uh, ones which you are looking at. And this year, uh, last year, 2023, in July, there was a whole report which came out to tell us what is the status. We started them in 2015, halfway through. Where are we in terms of these 17 sustainable development goals? Unfortunately, as you can see from the figure on the right here, so only 15% of the sustainable development goals, we are on track. Whereas in the rest of the 48%, we are moderately and severely off track. And then 37% are stagnated or regression. So if we go at this pace, we will not be able to meet any of the sustainable development goals. It's unfortunate to say that unless we really make a rapid change in the way we look at it and how we invest it and how we move forward in that direction. So midway through, only 15% has been reached. And then, okay, of those, 17 sustainable development goals. That was the overall combination of all 17 goals. Now, where are we at the each of those development goals? Uh, this is a visual which gives you all the development goals on the, on the left-hand side, and the green ones are on track. The yellow ones are for fair progress. The red ones are stagnated, and then the gray ones are insufficient data. 
So I'm just telling you those which are mainly ag-related activities will have on those, uh, especially the G1, no poverty, uh, G2, zero hunger, goal three, good health and well-being, goal five, gender equity, goal eight, decent work and economic growth, goal 10, uh, reduced inequalities, and goal 13, uh, climate actions. So all of those are the ones which are less than 15 percent, not even at the 15 percent. So that's, that's something to be worried about. And that is under the premise right now, today, 2023, this data, 820 million people do not have access to food. That is unacceptable. And majority of those are, 75 percent of those are women, and 80 percent are living in the areas which is impacted by climate change. And that does not count the impact of COVID-19 and the current uh, economic crisis and also the current uh, conflicts going around the world. The moderate conservative number is that that will add another 200 or 150 to 200 million people to the existing number. That means a billion people do not have access to food. Not only that, we are also threatened by malnutrition. Having food is one thing, but nutritional component of that is very important. And that's what I call it as a triple threat. So we have people, about 148 million children under the age of five who are stunted, which are too short for their age. 45 million are wasted, which are too thin for their age. And not only that, we also have 70, 37 million people who are too heavy, obese, too heavy for their age. So that's a triple threat. So combine, combine that, it, it, it's a too much of an issue. And if you look at the micronutrient deficiency, the zinc and the iron, two billion people are malnourished in terms of micronutrient deficiencies. That is also unacceptable. So that's that, that with that premise. So now, the concept of sustainable agricultural intensification. So the whole concept here, the goal is to provide access to safe, nutritious, healthy food at all times to all people from existing farmland without damaging our natural resources and ecosystem health. So that's some concept of sustainable agricultural intensification because we have issues with food and nutrition security, but we don't have more land to bring into agriculture without devastating our forests. So we have to produce more from less or from existing farmland. There are three important components to that, genetic intensification, which is on the red, which is focused on higher yields, resilience to pests and diseases, tolerant to abiotic stresses, higher nutrition, and both traditional and uh, innovative new uh, gene editing tools are on the table. And the second one is agroecological intensification. That is focused on a diversified diversification, cropping systems, farming systems, uh, improved agronomy, integrated nutrient, soil, water, and pest management practices. It's more about agronomy. How do we manage the ecosystem and the environment well? And the third one is socioeconomic intensification, which is uh, focused on developing new markets, creating uh, new opportunities, building social capital, and also understanding the barriers of adoption uh, and institutional capacity building because it's not lack of the technologies which is an issue, it's an adoption of those technologies at a scale where it can have an impact on food nutrition security. And uh, all other innovative tools like digital, geospatial, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, mechanization, precision agriculture, microbiome, income generation, entrepreneurship are components of all three, compo all three aspects. So in, in brevity, what this does is this gives you the interaction between genotype by environment, by management, by social sciences, G by E by M by S interaction. Oftentimes we only do two of the four. Uh, not, sometimes maybe three, but we always miss the most important component, which is the social science piece of it. And gender, youth, and communication and data science are integral part of that. So my lab uh, at Kansas State University is focused on addressing this. Uh, this is one of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab, which is one of the long largest innovation lab. We started in 2014 and uh, will be finishing up in th this year. We have active research, uh, education, and outreach programs around the world across multiple uh, uh, countries and, and continents. Currently, we are working in 13 different countries, uh, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and Asia, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Malawi in East Africa, Senegal, Burkina, Niger, Mali in West Africa, and then Honduras, Guatemala, and Haiti in the Central America and Latin America regions. So I won't go into the details of this, but we have a very large portfolio. In each of those countries, we have a research program uh, focused on the need base, what they want us to be working on. And we also have uh, several consortium. One of the consortium is focused on mechanization, 
The second consortium is focused on digital tools and geospatial tools. The third one is a policy consortium. Fourth one is a soils consortium. So those are the three consortiums. And we also have centers of excellence on sustainable ag intensification and nutrition in Cambodia, in West Africa, in Koraf, in Sen with Senegal. And then we have one in CMARCH for Haiti, which is Center for Mitigation of uh, Adoption, Resilience, and Climate Change. And we are in the process of getting one started in Guatemala as well. So uh, anyone who wants to learn more about our lab, please visit our website, and you'll have more information there. So we have about 130 scientists, 120 organizations, with 20 US universities, nine CGR organizations, and 250 graduate students. So that's our portfolio. So it's the, all the work is being done by those fantastic scholars. And I get the privilege of standing in front of you and sharing their results. So now I will give you the current status of uh, sustainable ag intensification. So in 2018, we, we, uh, we the Dr. Jules Priddy, who is father of sustainable intensification, because he was the one who coined the term sustainable intensification in 19, uh, 1995. He is the, our external advisory board member. So he did a survey to find out where are we in terms of sustainable ag intensification around the world. So they looked at these seven uh, types, which is the integrated pest management, pest, manage, uh, pest management, conservation, agriculture, irrigated crops, pasture and forage redesign, trees, irrigation, water management, and intensive small patches, which is veg uh, commercial vegetables or, or, or horticulture crops. So uh, he estimated what was the status of those. So it's estimated that 163 million farms, which is 29% of the world, are practicing some form of sustainable ag intensification on 453 million hectares of land, which is 9% of the worldwide. So we are at a tipping point where it can make a significant impact on our food systems, agri-food systems. So that was five years ago. So those numbers, I truly believe, are significantly higher now. So that was the biophysical innovation, right? Those seven biophysical innovations. So he also led, a, led another paper which talked about why, why it happened. What was the primary reason? We have the innovations, we have the technologies, but what was the reasons? Uh, so what he observed was that for the same seven uh, types, uh, what, we, what was observed that there was an exponential increase in the number of social groups from 20 to year 2000 to 2020. Year 2000, there were only half a million of these uh, groups, social groups, but in 2020, that number increased to 8.5 million. So the whole of this social revolution behind, which allowed the adoption of these technologies, was very key. That's why when I said that in the G by E by M by S, S is very critical and import important. So that's about the technologies. With, with, what's the status of those? Now, what's the status of funding? Because, as I said, sustainable development goals, so we need to know how much, is, uh, how much we are investing in agriculture, how much we are investing in sustainable intensification, and what is the future requirement to meet some of the sustainable development goals. So there was an International Commission on Sustainable Ag Intensification formed in 2020 and finished in 2022, all during the COVID period. We never physically met. Entire commission ran online. So that's one of the adjustments we made because of the uh, COVID-19 issue. I was very privileged to be part of this commission, and I chaired a couple, uh, couple of programs there. Uh, so there's a lot of reports, policy reports, and the detailed reports which are published, and all of them are available online for you to look at. If you're interested to just look at what the, what, what the summary is, then the two pages will be very, one or two pages will be very valuable. But if you really want to look into the methodology and the entire report, all of those are available uh, in, in, on, on those websites. And also, all of these have been published in a, in a Frontiers in Sustainable Food Systems as a peer review journal article. So I'm just going to highlight three items. Uh, so that we get it, get to know what the status of this is at this point of time. So the first question was, how much we are investing in agriculture research as a globe? And this is focused on Global South, which is developing and developing low and middle income countries or developing economies. And I, I chaired this, this particular study, but it was conducted by Dahlberg Asia. So we invest about it's all in Global South, okay? Uh, so $60 billion is invested in the innovation, only innovation, I'm only talking about innovation in research, $60 billion. You may think it's a lot, but it's very less. 
it's only 4.5% of the contribution of agriculture GDP. So we're only investing 4.5% of the agriculture which provides on, in, uh, on innovation. So that's okay. The next question was, how much of that has to do anything to with, do with environmental goals, so the climate or the sustainable intensification the environment piece of it? Only 7% of that $60 billion is, has anything to do with the environment. And fascinating or shocking thing was half of that, only 3.5% has anything to do with social goals, which includes human dimension and the society. So with that type of investments, how can we meet sustainable development goals? So that's, uh, that's, that's what the current status was at, uh, that was the last, last 10 years from uh, 2010 to 2020. Okay. So the next question was, how much is needed? Right? So that's what is currently we're doing. So to be, at least meet some of the sustainable development goals and climate, track, climate goals, so how much is needed? $15 billion a year from now to 2030, if you are able to invest that much money, we will be able to minimize the hunger, reduce the hunger to current levels of 10 to 15 percent to 5 percent in the rest of the world. I know Sub-Saharan Africa, we can bring it down to 11 percent. And we can minimize the carbon emissions of 242 million metric carbon equivalents. We can minimize the water use by 10 percent. And we can reduce the deforestation by 925,000 hectares a mere $15 billion per year from now to 2030, we can actually make some progress in the sustainable development goals. And uh, if there is a way, there is definitely a will. So that's, that's the status. So now I want to give you examples of, uh, of various things. So I'm at, at 12 minute mark. So I'll, in the next 12 minutes, I'll give you 11 or 12 examples of some of the things, innovations which we can do to address some of these uh, sustainable development goals, especially when it relates to food security, nutrition security, climate security, and gender equity. I'll give you examples from all over the world. I'll start in Asia, or maybe I'll start in West Africa, but I'll provide you in one example from different parts of the countries which we are working on. The first one is uh, crop livestock interaction. We'll start with West Africa, Burkina, Senegal, and Niger. We know for smallholder farmers, both crops and livestock are very critical. There's, most of the time, farmers will have components of both. They may have big cattle, uh, or they may have pigs, or poultry, or aquaculture, but there is always some animal uh, piece along with the uh, agriculture or grain production systems. So we are looking at dual purpose crops, meaning that grain for human consumption, biomass for livestock, but there's always a need for both of them. So these are, the, we have dual purpose sorghum, dual purpose pearl millet, and dual purpose cowpea, which we are promoting in the smallholder farmers. So the grain has also has high zinc and high iron, so that they can have the nutritional piece of that. And those, those, those seeds are available. So that's one, one innovation, uh, which will address the food and nutrition security, and also takes care of the livestock. And then now we'll move to the East Africa and Tanzania and Malawi. We're calling doubled up legume system. We all know about cereal and legumes, right? And then we either we do rotation or we do intercropping, right? So here is an example of doubled up legume system where you have a maize in the middle, and then you have a pigeon pea, which is a taller legume, and a perennial as well. And then that's an intercropping between cereal and pigeon pea. And pigeon pea is tall. Under the canopy of the pigeon pea, you can grow a shorter crop like groundnut or cowpea. So now you have two legumes and one cereal. So that's what we call a double up legume system. It's utilizing the below ground resources very effectively, the water and the nutrients, and also above ground in terms of the light interception. So that's a nice uh, way of having a double up legume system, uh, which has environmental benefits, also biological nitrogen fixation, and the perennial leaves drop, and then they provide the uh, organic matter to the soil. So that's a double double up legume system. And then we have, we know the issue with the uh, rainfall. So now we're having, having high intensity rainfalls. The total rainfall in the future is, may increase, but it'll happen in a high intensity rainfalls and there'll be a prolonged drought between the two rainfall events. So we have to capture this high intensity rainfall through different methodologies. One of them is called, uh, through in-situ water management, and you can also do through watersheds. But one of the examples of in-situ water management is tide ridges, meaning that you have these ridges 
and then you tie at a frequent intervals so that when the rain falls they have more time for infiltration and uh, the water will actually go into the soil and not cause runoff and uh, of nutrients and soil and other things and then sometimes on the buns you can actually grow a another species like pigeon pea or grass which will also provide you with more uh, biomass for your livestock feed so that's a uh, in situ water harvesting so that's just another example and then most of the time the watershed another big approach but watershed you collect the water in the ponds right so you, how do you utilize those ponds uh, water is through uh, integration of uh, vegetables in in the uh, in the home yard but providing irrigation through that source using drip irrigation and conservation agriculture so this we are looking at conservation agriculture practices the three principles are continuous soil cover no till and rotations or diversification so we are doing that we are using the locally available mulch and putting it on 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 the soil and we are irrigating through drip irrigation system so it is minimizing the water water loss as well so and then of course there are no no tillage or minimum tillage only to remove the weeds and we are seeing significant benefits so i should acknowledge from each of these slides the people who have done the work and the organizations with which we are collaborating are already shown in their logos so i should have said that in the, my first slide but uh, i wanted to say it now and acknowledge all the people who are doing the work so that's a conservation agriculture and then we know when we are solar power is a big issue so water lifting women are the one who are lifting the water from the wells or nearby ponds uh, which is a very back breaking uh, event so we are using solar power for water lifting and also water delivering through the uh, drip irrigation systems and we also have these sensors small sensor placed there which will tell you when to stop too much irrigation is also a major issue so 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 these simple innovations of solar power for water lifting for delivering through drip irrigation systems and having a sensor when to stop so those will improve the water productivity and minimize the waste and losses of water so that's that's in ethiopia but can be and also in cambodia but can be used used globally as well and in in, in coming to asia in in uh, in bangladesh we are working on high zinc rice and this is a non gmo traditional breeding uh, done by bangladesh rice research institute uh, and this is a shorter duration uh, variety so we are able if you are able to harvest quickly and also plant quickly you can use using mechanization tools you have a window of about maybe 60 days and we are incorporating a new crop like mung bean or sesame or maize so we are using high zinc short duration rice at the main and then we are also mechanizing on the front end for quickly uh, uh, transplanting and pla planting and also mechanizing at the end by and that saves us time about 15 days in the front and the back and then you have 30 days between so you can incorporate a new crop and sometimes you are also integrating fish or uh, aquaculture into our uh, into the production systems and then the perennials uh, in, in those home commercial vegetable gardens on the borders we are having this perennial crops especially acacia panara uh, which provides high vitamin a and then there are also wild gardens with different types of heights and different uh, different uh, uh, tree species and which gives fruits at a different time of the year so that way you can address have some food security throughout the year and then this is minimum till or no till uh, i'm saying minimum till because for no till you required mechanization you also required herbicide options so those are limited in in sub saharan africa so we are talking about minimum till we get sometimes we may not get the yield benefit but the economic benefit of the labor saving is is there and then agroforestry is an integral part this is a visual from senegal um, uh, our friend from nigeria would easily recognize this uh, director from from federal university there so this is uh, this is a fiberbia albida and this is a cropping season the tree is naked it does not have any leaves that means it's not competing with your main crop and if you go to the during the summer the tree will be the only one which has a green and then the rest of it is there so it's not competing that's called reverse phenology and the trees have deeper rooting depths so hydraulic lift they are lifting the water level from the deeper level to the higher so that's another and there's also shrub systems as well 
uh, the Engera senegalensis and Pleostigma reticulata. Those are the sh these are trees and these are shrubs. So a nice way of integrating uh, agroforestry systems. And the second last example is on the when we talk about greenhouse gases, rice, methane emissions, and nitrous oxide emissions are very critical. And the application of deplacement of urea and in a brisket, not in a prill urea, so that, 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 that will minimize the losses of ni nitrous oxide losses as well. And then putting it by hand at a place is very complicated. So there's a mechanized, mechanized uh, application of the deplacement of fertilizer urea is there. And the last example I would like to give is in the pest management. So we typically use chemicals for pest management, but here's a technology from developed from ICPA, which is called push and pull technology. So you have this maize as a main crop, and stem borer is your insect. You have intercrop of desmodium, which produces volatiles, which will repel the pest from the main crop. And on the borders, you have, you have an apiar grass, which will attract the stem borer. So that way it's called push and pull. There are several examples which, uh, which will follow this type of, and this is primarily because of the volatiles which these crops are producing. So that was my last example. So I'm at almost 20 minute mark. So, so in conclusion, uh, sustainable intensification provides multiple options and a holistic uh, solution to address food, nutrition, climate, water, and energy security. An engagement with the farmers, youth, value chain partners, private industry is critical and should occur from the start, not as an afterthought or not in the middle. And understanding the social networks and barriers are equally important rather than coming up with new innovations to remove the barriers of adoption. And focus should be on the creating enabling environment uh, for scaling and innovation of technologies. And for this, interdisciplinary research and collaboration is critical and needed multiple disciplines going beyond biophysical sciences into social sciences and better linkages of agriculture. We should promote agriculture as nutrition, agriculture as health, agriculture as food, agriculture as business, agriculture as technology. So that, that should be articulated very well. And then there is urgent need to increase the investments in innovation, building social capital, human resources, institutional capacity, and scaling to meet the sustainable development goals. With that, I would like to thank my team here who does all the great work. And then also would like to thank the organizers once again and the SARM for giving me this fantastic opportunity. Sarve Jana Sukhano Bhavantu, Jaihan. So I'm at 22 minute mark, so I don't know if there's time for questions or not. Yeah, yeah. I'd be glad to take any questions you might have. Jaihan. Jaihan, yeah. Okay. Please identify yourself, uh, briefly your name, and then uh, ask the question. I am a Professor Om Prakash Dankar from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, USA. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Vara Prasad, thank you very much for such a broader aspects of the entire agriculture sy system, climate change and adaptation. My question to you is about the Bangladesh, uh, mm -hmm. the short term, uh, short duration rice and high zinc and iron. Mm -hmm. So Bangladesh is well is highly affected by the arsenic in mm -hmm. rice, mm -hmm. especially arsenic in rice Absolutely. because of the underground water contaminant and they're irrigating mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, have you, is your, has your team check, check that arsenic in those high arsenic and zinc because arsenic and uh, iron directly interact mm -hmm. <coughs> on mm -hmm. the soil, mm -hmm. uh, on, on the root, uh, root system mm -hmm. and high iron in the soil can prevent the arsenic uptake or less iron can increase the arsenic uptake. Thank you very much uh, for the, that very important question, Dr. Om Prakash. Uh, we have not checked the arsenic concentrations in the grain or in the plant in these uh, varieties which are being produced in the coastal communities. And you're absolutely right that our work is in the coastal zone and the polder communities where there is arsenic issues because of the ground of the soil itself is arsenic and then also irrigation and the, the pollutants as well is an issue. So that we'll, we'll make sure that, uh, we'll, I'll inform that to our partners and we'll measure the arsenic concentration in the grain and see if there is an issues. But uh, there is also issues with acidity and uh, which has related to the iron as well, and uh, low iron and then also high iron, both ends rice. So that, that's a very important point. And, and then uh, on the extension on that one is when you said that with the short duration rice, there is a window of 60 days. 
So they are putting a short dress on uh, like a legume or something. Yeah, legume or uh, vegetables are... And, and, are, and uh, that's uh, also another risk, uh, uh, food safety risk in that right. one is because uh, more arsenic built up during the rice growth mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, de repeated irrigation, mm -hmm. then the legumes will pick up that arsenic as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Arsenic is a huge issue, heavy metals uh, in, in entire country of Bangladesh. So that's, that's a great question. An important question as well. Any other question? Yes, that's a question. Yeah, please, uh, can you please pass the microphone to her? I think we have multiple microphones here on the table, so maybe distribute it. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Christelle Ledroit from uh, Fibel Syscom India. Mm -hmm. And I just have a question because I've seen that you have projects all over Africa and in Asia, you have in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. How come you don't have any project in India? Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent question. So this, my, as, I, as I said, my project is funded by USAID, US Agency for International Development, under the program called Feed the Future. So this is a whole of the government initiative, started with President Obama, then continued under Doug, uh, Trump, and then continuing now. So at that time, they have identified 21 countries around the world based on food security, nutrition security, need, and the governance. So those are the four criteria. There are others, but those are the four important criteria to identify a pick a country. So India is the fifth largest economy in the world, and it is a rich nation. It's a distribution of the wealth as an issue. So at that point of time, through this Feed the Future program, India did not qualify, is not as poor enough to, <laughs> and we don't want to be in that, that, that condition at all. Uh, but this program, Feed the Future, is not directly funding the innovation labs for this research. But USAID funds a lot of issues with health, especially when it comes to uh, TB uh, and also um, the, AI, the AIDS, and then uh, water and sanitation programs are well there. And there are also partner organizations which, uh, like the CGIR organizations, which receive funding and they do a lot of research. They're just the innovation labs, which are not working directly in India, but Recently, last year, I think India is, is, is not the Feed the Future country, but an alliance country, because some of the research which we do here would be relevant to Nepal and Bangladesh, which are the Feed the Future countries. Good question. So that's my response. Yeah. Well, uh, I have a small question here. Uh, what about millets cultivation everywhere in the world? Mm -hmm. Because you know it has time has come mm -hmm. to think about alternative crop, you know, sure. and small crop. Sure. And millet can grow in countries like India, you know, you know, okay. and many other African countries, you know, and, you know. Yes. So maybe it could be yep. a. Thank you very much for that crop question. Crop future. Yes, the millet is a very important millets. Millets, because it's a, millet is not a one crop. There's about 13 species which are qualifies as, as millets, and the four four biggest one or the three biggest one is sorghum or jowar, pearl millet or bajra, finger millet uh, is the three 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 ones, and then there's foxtail millet, there's teff, there is quinoa, and I can go on. There's about 13 or 14 different things. International Year of Millets was celebrated last year, 2023 under the leadership of India, supported by nine other countries, and then it's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a very good initiative. When it comes to climate resilience, millets are the most climate resilient crops because their water requirements is very less, anywhere from 400 millimeters and less. So that's if, wherever there is drought and opportunity, millets are a very good source of uh, crop there. They're also very short duration. There's a lot of diversity. We just look at sorghum, 45,000 accessions. Uh, just one crop. So there's a lot of genetic diversity in all of these millets. We need uh, different durations, so we need to capture that. And then more importantly, with our previous speaker uh, eloquently talked about the temperature increase, both the season-long temperature increase and the short duration. Right now we are about 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than what we were before. COP28, if you're following, our goal is to minimize the future by less than 1.5 degrees, or at least 2 degrees or less. But is not good. Uh, this 
stage at the level, current levels of investment does not look like it's going to be happening. Maybe we'll be transitioning through fossil fuels. But then the most heat tolerant crop is millets. You asked about the, the temperature response, right? So if you, the, the, if you look at the temperature response or the ceiling temperatures of various cereals and legumes, so the first one is uh, wheat, 32 degrees Celsius. Rice is 35. Corn or maize is 30, 33, 34. Ceiling temperature at which there is no formation of grain or seed. Uh, and then pearl millet, sorghum is uh, 38. Pearl millet is 40 degrees Celsius. The most heat tolerant crop is uh, among the cereals is pearl millet. And then same, so millets have a very good role moving forward, whether it's temperature stress or, uh, or drought stress. And more importantly, they are nutri cereals. They are very high in uh, micronutrients. They are also very high in antioxidants. They and have proteins. therapeutic values. And protein. protein as well. Now, there, now you have uh, high protein, I mean, not as high as wheat, but relatively relative. And more importantly, it's also gluten free. Uh, those who are suffering from uh, from celiac disease, which are susceptible to wheat gluten, there's an uh, alternative. So I, I truly believe that in future millets will be the climate resilient crops, but we need to recognize one thing, especially with, my, with our friends in Africa and a lot of us in India. In India and Africa, millets are human food. The majority of the millet, sorghum or pearl millet is consumed as a human food. The rest of the world are in, in developed nations like in Australia and especially in, in US, it's all livestock feed. Grain grain is fed to livestock. So I was shocked when I went to you, when I come from India and in South India from uh, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Uh, when I took this position in Kansas, I was never thought that you can feed the grain to the livestock. I thought it would be human food, but 85% uh, of the grain sorghum is for livestock, 15% is for biofuels now, very few targeted you. But that is going to change because of the current projection of millets as a nutri cereals. And if ma many of us, how many of you know quinoa? Raise your hand. Quinoa. Quinoa is a crop, right? So 10 years, 15 years ago, I never knew about anything about quinoa. But quinoa crashed through the market, become the health and innovative food. Uh, and I think, truly believe that millets will be the next quinoa. And if you look at quinoa, 2014 or 2013, don't quote me on this, 2013 or 2014 was celebrated as an international year of quinoa took 10 years uh, and then it's a lot of investments so I hope that next future will be the uh, per millets will really be the nutrient cereals and also climate resilient cereals. Long, Thank you long, Dr. Long Prasad. answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Dr. Prasad for excellent lecture.